Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our second and final day of the scientific forum. Uh, those of you, well, most of you were here yesterday, you will know um, that we really covered a lot of ground uh, in the realm of how science and technology is making serious improvements in our way of life, uh, particularly in the agriculture sector. There were really interesting examples from all over the world. Um, we heard from different stakeholders. And one of the things that really came through was partnership and how important that is uh, in all of our efforts. Um, and today we're sort of staying on that as we get into our third session of the forum, and that is fostering partnership building and mobilizing resources so that we're able to increase um, our sustainable impact. And in this session, we will be exploring how partnering with diverse stakeholders can ensure the long-term sustainability of this initiative of ours, the Atoms for Food. So we've pulled together the expertise, the resources, and the collaborative efforts of national and international networks, uh, complex challenges in sustainable agricultural production, as well as rural development, how these can effectively be addressed. Um, and just as we had yesterday, uh, my speakers today have all prepared wonderful presentations for us this morning. They also have the task of taking everything they know and suppressing it into uh, seven or eight minutes for us today. And I know that they're going to do a good job uh, in that. As uh, we did as well yesterday, there will be an opportunity at the end of all of their presentations to engage them in Q&A. And that is also uh, for our audience that is attending virtually. So let's get right into it uh, this morning. And our first presentation is coming to us from Mr. Festus Akinfesi. He is the head of the unit for multi-partner initiatives and flexible funding at FAO. His presentation is titled Funding in Agriculture and Food Security, the Current Status, Challenges and Lessons. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Festo Sakini Fesi. Uh, I work with FAO uh, in the uh, area of uh, multi-partner initiatives and flexible funding. I'll be talking on funding in agriculture and food security. We all know uh, that all our efforts to achieve sustainable agriculture, food security, and nutrition has been defied by inadequate resources. And uh, the ODA uh, is, the major, is one of the major contributors to financing of food security and, uh, uh, and nutrition and agriculture. Uh, however, the resources from ODA has been also experiencing intense uh, pressures. Uh, for instance, the share, the share of the uh, 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 ODA envelope has been declining since 1983 when it was 20% uh, to 5% at this time. Um, for many of you that have seen, must have seen the SOFI uh, 2024, uh, the State of Food and uh, Nutrition uh, 2024, uh, it is focusing on financing to end hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition in all firms, uh, just to address also further uh, this uh, topic. And the SOFI uh, 20, uh, 2024 has pointed out an important uh, knowledge gap uh, which is the difficulty to actually measure and define uh, financing in food security and agriculture. And it has proposed uh, the definition there uh, that I have on the screen, uh, financing for food security and nutrition, uh, referring to public and private uh, resources, financial resources, both domestic and foreign, that are directed towards eradicating hunger, food insecurity, and, and all forms of malnutrition. And that problem is in that graph that uh, I have there, uh, showing different estimates depending on who uh, is estimating. And that has compromised the effort to address the problem. Uh, there are other innovative uh, funding instruments in agri-food systems. Um, these innovative funding mechanisms refers to non-traditional sources of funds. That is, efforts to raise new uh, funds for development. And there are several uh, uh, options. There are a very wide range of mechanisms. Uh, they also defy uh, definitions because the list is quite long. But I've just indicated two examples there. The climate finance, blended finance, resource-based or impact financing, uh, uh, sustainability link loans, etc. And uh, the benefits uh, include the following. It increases the volume 
uh, an efficiency and effectiveness of financial flows. Uh, it complements also existing funds uh, in order to generate new, scalable, and sustainable uh, sources of funds that is different from the traditional sources. Uh, also, it provides the opportunity to leverage expertise and resources of other stakeholders in the finance and development uh, uh, sectors. Uh, it creates opportunities also to achieve uh, uh, results with finance. And of course, the, uh, the risking of the, uh, the, the risking, that is sharing of the risk among the different stakeholders. And here I've also indicated some other uh, financing, uh, financing uh, mechanisms uh, from private sector, for instance, which is very difficult to track. The blended finance is very modest in general, and also we have other sources like the philanthropic uh, source flows. Uh, we have the remittances, which is quite substantial, about 29 billion uh, per year, and direct investment, uh, uh, which is also substantial. And there is also indication that the net banking loans in agriculture is declining from, 20, uh, from 20, 22 billion in uh, uh, 2011 to, uh, to less than 2 billion in 2021. Now, the question is how much money is needed? That is a big elephant in the room. And we will all agree that what is limiting us from achieving uh, uh, impact and uh, making a difference is lack of resources. There has been several estimates. The World Bank, for instance, estimated that 500 billion US dollars would be needed to address uh, food security and nutrition, which is about 0.5% of the global GDP. But when you look at developing countries, that is also uh, representing 95% of their GDPs. Also, there are other uh, estimates. Uh, it has also been estimated, especially that is indicated in the SOFI 2024, that several trillions of dollars will be needed to address just SDGs 2 alone, targets 2.1 and 2.2. So that means we need other sources of our finance. We need to make finance more uh, efficient and also innovative. We need to explore other uh, forms and tools for reform. The UN uh, development system has most of its funds from the, OD, uh, from the OECD uh, and uh, non-OECD countries, representing about 65.9 uh, billion US dollars. And most of that uh, resources are actually air-marked. Only 10% of that resource is, of that uh, fund is uh, flexible. That is core, uh, which can be applied uh, more flexibly. For that reason, the UN Funding Compact uh, agreed in 2019 with member states and the UN to increase this share of flexible funds. And that will lead us to the next uh, topic. But it requires major shifts in the op uh, modus operandi of the present uh, ways of doing business in the financing sector. Now, what are the benefits of flexible funds? The argument here is the need to increase the share of flexible funds in order to have greater flexibility so we can address problems at the right time and uh, are more flexibly. And it also offers opportunity uh, to achieve larger shared outcomes. That is different small resources from different donors pulled together uh, that could be applied uh, flexibly can achieve larger shared outcomes. Uh, it also in increases the uh, chance of uh, uh, coherence and coordination, not only among the donors, but also the implementing uh, organizations or institutions. And also the uh, reduction in transaction cost and reduced uh, fragmentation, as well as increased efficiency are all the benefits, as well as the opportunities to create impact, to use the existing funds to leverage uh, uh, the uh, flexible funds. I mean, use the flexible funds to leverage existing funds. But of course, there are challenges. Uh, many resource partners, which people call donors. Uh, we want to have visibility, ownership, and also some uh, accountability. Because of that, some are not very uh, open to flexible funds. But I think that is, uh, there is the need to make a very strong case for that if we must make a dent uh, to the problems at hand. In order to achieve as my take home, in order to achieve transformative impact in agriculture and food security, 
there is need to shift. There is a need for a shift in the financing uh, strategies. And first here is the need to increase finance. We all agree uh, uh, that agriculture and food security uh, needs a lot more resources in volume. We also need to increase the share of the development funding that goes to agriculture and food security because currently large proportion of these resources go to emergencies and humanitarian. There is also the need to apply different innovative funding instruments uh, in order to mobilize resources at scale, at scale. And also, we need to look at both the scale as well as the quality, the quality in terms of the flexibility of using those resources. And finally, to make all this, uh, uh, to bring all this together, there is need for policy levers uh, by the government to create incentives and also to turbocharge the financing, uh, 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 the finance mobilization at all levels. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kim Thank you, Dr. Kinfesi. Our next uh, presentation is going to be delivered by Mr. Gunter Berger. He is Managing Director for the Directorate for SDG Innovation and Economic Transformation at UNIDO. Uh, his presentation is about UNIDO's role in mobilizing partnerships for food security. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you very much, um, dear Christine. and. Uh, First of all, I'm very uh, delighted to be invited uh, to uh, this um, uh, conference today, and uh, this is another good sign for our partnership, partnership with the International Atomic um, Energy Agency. I don't know is, if Magda is in the room, but we have very fruitful um, cooperation over the last years, and thanks, thanks um, um, Magda and for, for that. Um, I, I understand uh, we are all experts here in the room and my colleague from FAO makes my life uh, easier, much more easier because he mentioned a lot of figures I have in my, in my script. Uh, but let me f perhaps only add uh, two, three additional ones. Uh, and I think we all, all, all agree here in the room that uh, of course it is a scandal that more than 800 million people in the world suffer from hunger despite of all our efforts over the last uh, 50, 60 years, and 3 billion people do not have access to, to healthy nutrition. And on the other hand, uh, uh, we know that one third of the food produced in the field with all our support does not reach the human stom uh, stomach, and uh, food waste, food, food losses are a big problem when more or less we produce enough calories every, every day, every year to feed all the world. Um, but uh, um, uh, what, what I mentioned, 30% uh, uh, of the production is, is lost. And uh, another figure I also know from our colleagues from FAO, that the demand for food will increase uh, by 50% over the next 30 years. So you see there are big, big challenges and absolutely agree with also the conclusions and the, uh, um, uh, the um, recommendations uh, of our friend from the FAO. Um, one other figure I want to share with you, experts have calculated that we need to invest four trillion US dollar every year if we want to achieve the SDGs in, in overall by 2030. And in contrast, and our colleagues uh, also show figures about the uh, official um, developing aid ODA all over, uh, all order, uh, order um, together is 200 million, uh, 200 billion US dollar, and so you see, see this uh, very relevant um, uh, gap, um, uh, uh, and uh, the challenge uh, we have have to work with, and uh, um, this show, this figure shows very, very uh, concretely that. ODA and governments, and we as international organizations, international organizations, UN organizations, we can't stem this uh, burden on, on, on our own. We need the private sector financing. But to mobilize sector, private sector financing, and our, our colleague already mentioned several points, we need first to expand innovative financing instruments. This includes uh, blended finance instruments where public funds are used to leverage uh, private funds. We need uh, public guarantees uh, that increase incentives for the private sector to invest uh, in areas that advance the SDGs. 
Secondly, it requires also, and that is very important, especially for us as uh, United Nations Industrial um, Development Organization, we need the know-how from the, from the business, innovation, technology, skills development. For that, we need public-private partnership with companies. And third, of course, and this was also, also a mentioned collaboration with philanthropic foundations. Um, and, but last not least, and that is very important, and, and we are here uh, 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 as two uh, or three, I understand, UN organization, we need concrete cooperation among us, among the UN organization. After all, we, we all work towards uh, the same goal. So let me use the second part of my, my seven minutes to give some few examples how we as UNIDO work uh, with partnerships. Uh, this uh, cooperation, this uh, part partnership cooperation is uh, more or less the basis for sustainable industrialization and we have a, a, a range of public-private sector partnerships with companies who want to increase impact. We work with more than 150 companies worldwide and try to create synergies from these partnerships. For example, with in the, in the coffee sector with companies like Ili and Lavazza. Uh, with Ili, we set up a private coffee innovation center for wider coffee value chain in Ethiopia with uh, financial support from the Italian government. I don't know if our Italian friends are here. Thank you very much. And the Ili Foundation. And for example, with Lat Lavazza, we are working on a circular economic center for, for coffee. On the uh, financial side, uh, joint programs with IFIs are crucial. Also, our colleague from FAO mentioned it already. This collaboration can catalyze investments in agriculture innovation and increase, of course, access to finance for smallholder farmers and actors among agribusiness and value chains. And uh, uh, investment uh, which are needed for uh, agriculture, um, uh, uh, transform agri agriculture system and making them more efficient, inclusive, resilient and sustainable. And uh, we are working together with, for example, um, the African Development Bank to establish uh, special agro-industrial processing zones with uh, demonstrate a strategic move towards boosting agriculture productivity and food production across Africa. We are also working on joint programs with the World Bank and IFC in the coffee sector to enable the necessary billions investment to made at the beginning of the supply chain. And uh, certainly, I also would would like to mention a new initiative, brand new initiative, uh, the UNIDO Transformation Pass Fund. The aim of this initiative is to set up a fund that provides capital for investments uh, um, in our TC projects, where, which are often bankt uh, bankable, but do not find the, the financing due to, to the higher risk. This is a new pass for a UN organization, but an important one, we think, because it could be a real game chamber in achieving SDGs. So um, once more, thank you very much. My time is over, I see. Um, I'm very grateful once more and thank the International Atomic en uh, Energy Agency that I could speak here today, present a little bit our work and uh, hope uh, also this uh, 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 very important topic today could be a starting point for more joint cooperation and partnerships among us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Berger. Our next presentation is coming from Dr. Huayum Sali. She is Director uh, of the African Union's Inter-African Bureau for Animal Resources. Her presentation is about the partnership for implementing AU priorities in animal production and health. Thank you so much and good morning to all of you. I will be presenting on our partnership to implement the African Union priorities for animal production and animal health. Um, actually, our office was established in 1951, and the main reason was to eradicate the rinder pest from the African continent. And then the work evolved in this office until it became like the leading organization and technical office in the African Union to develop uh, the animal resources of the continent. Our core functions are three. Uh, first, improving the animal health, disease prevention control systems, and enhancing animal resource production systems and ecosystems management, and improving access 
to input services and market for animal and animal products. So the majority of our work is done actually on partnership with different technical and funding partners. So here I'm, I'm giving two examples only of the successful partnership that achieved for Africa. The first one is um, the longest standing partnership for indirect best eradication from Africa. And, and this has been achieved by great uh, fund from the EU, um, the European Union, uh, with the leader organizations, the African Union Inter-African Bureau, uh, AUI bar with WOHA, OIE, FAO, and IAEA. So IAA during this um, journey, which, which is a very long journey, supported all the nuclear and nuclear-related diagnostic capacity building for African Union member states, and also provided technical support for the post-vaccination monitoring, which is so important in achieving the eradication, and established the Rinder Best Laboratories Network to enable technology transfer and building capacities across the African Union member states. So if you look at this figure, you'll see that this journey has started since 19. 1962 ended 2010 um, through different three projects. Through these projects, AUI Bar was leading um, the eradication process with FAO, OIE, and IAA. And this has been um, a very successful partnership ended by the eradication of the Rinder Pest from the African continent. The second example of the partnership is um, the international. Scientific Council for Trypanosomiasis Research and Control. This uh, partnership established since 1949, and it's continuing until now, with all um, um, representation for the executive committee from Eastern, Western, Central, and Southern Africa, and uh, AUI, BAR, FAO, IAA, WHO, ICP, ITC, ELRI, CIRDIS, PAD, and PATEC. There is many achievements done through um, this partnership. First, um, the organization of the conference where the secretary is hosted in AUI bar. And the last meeting was held last year in Mombasa, September 2023. Um, during this executive committee um, meetings also, there is a good recommendations coming out to support all um, the research and the control centers across Africa. So during 2027, 20, 2007, um, there was uh, strengthening uh, support to uh, the ITC Center in Gambia. Um, the BATIC was launched during one of these uh, conferences. Uh, there was also launching of some projects led by AUI Bar uh, during 1999. Um, also, um, there is some recommendation to consider um, the emergency uh, of the African animal trypanosomiasis. And um, as you see, it has been along um, the work uh, continuing since 1949. So despite all these successful stories, we still have other priorities that are still opportunities for more partnerships. So here I'm, I'm giving two uh, major areas, animal and one health uh, opportunities. And those are the priorities identified by the African Union. Uh, the first priority is the eradication of the pest to be teeth ruminants, the PPR, and this is the second animal diseases to be eradicated from the world. The second is supporting the control and the eradication of the rabies, and then uh, the control of the contagious bovine blurry pneumonia, trypanosomiasis, MR surveillance, and building the capacities for aquatic animal health and also the food safety control. For animal production, we have main three areas supporting the improvement of the genetic resources where we need to scale up uh, some of the very successful experiences through the AUI bar projects and supporting the resilient systems for animal feed and fodder, uh, mentioning in particular the analysis capacities for nutritive value and mycotoxins for animal feed and fodder. Um, advancing sustainable value uh, chains. This is one of our priorities as well. So despite all this success, there is still challenges into the partnership. First of all, there is lack of coordination and alignment of interest between the technical partners and also with um, the implementing organizations and the donors. There is no fund sustainability maintained be uh, beyond the project so that we can achieve on the programmatic level approach. Also, 
the monitoring and evaluation still needs lots of uh, improvement so that we can address the improvement and the progress on the impact level. There is many communication gaps and interruptions in some projects, um, implementation and risk of duplication and fragmentation. And this is happening due to lack of communication. So we have a vision in AUI bar adopted since um, 2023 and before that to address these challenges for resource mobilization and partnership. First of all, to update and share the program plan at medium and long-term level. And this is happening through the AUI bar strategic plan. The next one will be 2024-2028. Renovating our website so partners will know more about our work measuring the impact and this is to establish tool to measure and share the information on the performance of the animal resources through the annual AUI bar result report but also by establishing animal resource performance dashboard in Africa and this is an ongoing project that we are developing with development gateway so that this will be shared in our website for public. Um, effective coordination and partnership and resource mobilizations. This will be happening through our annual high-level coordination meeting with all the key partners and also sharing our resource mobilization um, strategy and partner, partner engagement meetings, this planned for the end of this year. Um, and also we are planning to have the first African Union uh, conference on animal resources by the end of 2028. This is the last uh, slide in my presentation. I'm here, uh, I have tried to capture some of our current key partners, um, donors and technical organizations that supporting us in achieving our mandate as AUI bar. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sally. Our next speaker is Ms. Sonia Samut. She is the National Ambassador for Organic and Sustainable Food, as well as the Director of Food Systems in the Ministry for Agriculture, Fisheries and Animal Rights in Malta. Her presentation is titled Fostering Cooperation, Learning from the Past to Shape a Better Future. Good morning. I would like to thank the Director General, the Executive Committee and the organizers uh, for inviting me to participate in the important discussions of this scientific forum, as well as my, as well as my Maltese colleagues at the embassy here in Vienna for making this happen. And uh, it was a pleasure also to meet Director Sophie earlier this morning and to discuss common issues. I have been very brief in my slides, so I kindly ask you to focus on what I have to say instead. Yesterday, we saw how we can apply the psychology of economics by Daniel Kahneman to climate change thinking. Today, to demonstrate the power of cooperation, I will borrow what uh, evolutionary psychologist Jeffrey Miller calls a Pleistocene fantasy. It is the story of how a mammoth is defeated by pack hunters thanks to their well-coordinated attack. With his last thought before bleeding to that being, I am extinguished by a bunch of little bodies that weave themselves through that odd squeaking into one great body with dozens of eyes, dozens of arms, and one little will. For smaller countries, establishing strong international partnerships and aligning with larger nations is crucial for ensuring food security and promoting agricultural resilience. As the link between the Maltese authorities and the IAEA, the FAO, IFAD, and the World Food Program, the permanent representations of Malta here in Vienna and in Rome work to advance UN efforts in the areas of emergency food assistance, food safety, standards, agriculture, fisheries, forests, and financing for rural development. Malta continues to demonstrate its commitment to food security by contributing to the World Food Programme country offices in Yemen, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Myanmar, Libya, Sudan, Gaza, and Ethiopia. 
Presently, Malta is also working on a meaningful contribution to the FAO's work in Palestine, rebuilding resilience in agriculture, and addressing the fundamental root cause of food insecurity, as opposed to simply treating it as a symptom of conflict and inequalities. This also demonstrates how embassies can and should be used as bridges between vital international organizations to foster partnerships and act as a liaison for valuable thematic work. For nearly 30 years now, as a member state of the IAEA, Malta has had an active role in showcasing how the peaceful uses of nuclear science and technology can be used and diffused for innovation and sustainability in action. Malta's long-standing cooperation with the IAEA has opened the door for many fruitful developments. Despite our size, Malta is duly obliged to give back to the cause, resulting in our involvement in the Race of Hope initiative and the more recent Atoms for Food program. The Atoms for Food program provides for various opportunities for working together and using nuclear science to inform and support the transition to healthier food system. Presently in Malta, we are on the verge of integrating food safety and security functions into a single authority, something that will accentuate the need to expand capability in risk assessment, detection, monitoring and analysis of pesticides, veterinary drugs, and contaminants, as well as the scientific reference and interpretation for food safety and quality, including the need for mobile testing technology that can be taken to the field, as we have heard yesterday from the speaker from Namibia. Through the Atoms for Food for Better Agriculture, we are now dealing with a different audience, perhaps one which is less knowledgeable and receptive to scientific techniques, prompting the need for a different communication and engagement strategy. In the Pleistocene fantasy, the hunting mission was successful thanks to language. As a policy scientist, I believe that we must be as robust in our communication as we are in our methods of investigation, especially in helping users understand the costs and benefits of new technologies, ensuring traceability, sound information, and respect for choice of producers, retailers, and consumers is fundamental in matters that are complicated and surrounded by fear and legal uncertainty, such as, for example, innovative plant breeding techniques. As the Director General said in his opening statement yesterday, we are here not talking about genetic modification. We also need to create innovative ways of financing the transition to sustainable agri-food systems. But mobilizing resources is not just about finance. Resources include the human capacity to work together with a common set of principles towards a common goal. Just like the United Nations goal is for peace, here our aim is to use nuclear resources for the common good, to create, not destroy. As a thematic ambassador, I do my best to serve as an instrument for forging these new partnerships. Earlier this year, during the International Symposium on Food Safety Control here in Vienna, I spoke about the significant role of women in food security. Today, I take the opportunity to repeat that message and in addition point out the possibilities that emerge when we engage with the curious minds of young girls and boys in schools. The United Nations and its agencies are the pinnacle of cooperation among nations. More resources are needed to achieve its just aims for the common good. A common saying in Maltese is, flus, latana meaning money is needed for everything. 
However, our best resources are trust and the willingness to work together to achieve a better future. That is what we must encourage, foster, and apply. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Summit. Our next presentation is going to be presented by Dr. Chara Watson. She's the Executive Director of the Scientific Research Council in Jamaica. Her presentation is Unleashing the Power of Nuclear Applications for Sustainable Development Through Strengthened Partnerships uh, with a Showcasing of Reviving Ginger Production in Jamaica. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and greetings from Jamaica. So I'll be talking to you about a project that we have implemented, or better yet, a program, looking at our very important ginger. If you know any Jamaican, you know that we take our ginger just as serious as we take our athletics, as we take our music, and as we take pretty much everything in Jamaica. So ginger, as some of you might know, is an awesome spice. And in Jamaica, as much as we like jerk, we like ginger. So Jamaica ginger is well known globally for its potency, its quality, and its flavor. Majority of the ginger that is produced in Jamaica is actually consumed by Jamaicans. But because of its, its quality, it is globally renowned and have a high value. So it is in high demand, but we cannot produce enough of it to meet those demands. And it's not just an economic issue, it's a social and cultural issue. If we don't have ginger, it's, it's very likely that you will not find us being happy. So what led to Jamaica's issue where ginger is concerned? In the 1930s to the 1960s, we were one of the main producers of, and exporters of ginger. However, due to disease, mainly ginger rhizome rot and bacterial wilt, we had a sharp decline in our ginger production. And this we found to be significant enough, warranting national attention, which led the government to identify ginger as a priority crop that we needed to pay special attention to, not just from an economic perspective, as I mentioned, but because of the social and cultural ramification of not being able to provide or supply the demands for ginger. So what did we do? So from a government led by the Ministry of Agriculture, we set out several plans or developed several programs to revitalize our ginger. We saw it important enough and we came together as a country to see how we could you know, put steps in place to have our production level um, back to where it needed. So several parties came involved, and as I mentioned, this was led by the Ministry of Agriculture with several stakeholders, starting with the producers. So like most countries, ginger is one of the products that is mainly produced by far smallholder farmers. So one to half acre lots. Uh, so you can imagine the impact in terms of rural community. This was the livelihood of many small farmers. So they were at the, the, the starting point. And the collaboration that we used looked at from the primary producers all the way to your consumers and exporters. We also had a whole of government kind of approach where, again, the Ministry of Agriculture being the anchor, we had our government agencies, the departments, and relevant stakeholder groups that were involved in the coordinated efforts. So, we had multi-agency partnership with both national, international, and regional agencies. We also looked at how it is that we could use the information that we had at hand at the time to understand the problem and put in solutions. The strategies included developing technology transfer and capacity building, as well as looking at infrastructure development that we needed. So in the earlier days, we had some success. So the, the decline initially was observed in the early 90s. In 2001 to 2005, on our own, we started 
seen a problem and started the production program, a productivity incentive program where the government incentivized farmers to, to boost ginger production. We had some success, but just for a year. <laughs> we then witnessed a sharp decline again because the approach taken then was just to boost production. We were not analyzing what the real issues were leading to the reduction in, in production and why farmers were no longer farming ginger. Ginger takes nine months to come. And if you plant that ginger, and after nine months you're reaping nothing, I'm not gonna plant that, I'm gonna try something else. So that's exactly what was happening. So we looked at the problem again, and this time around in 2014, again through government and Ministry of Agriculture initiative, we started now analyzing what the, the, the situation was, looking at the disease, and came up with a certification program to give farmers more confidence that the material that they're planting are clean. And we got successes again. But again, the decline happened. And that led us to take a different approach. And this is where our international partners came in. And this is where we now focus mostly on capacity building, focus on organizing and getting relevant stakeholder groups at the table from the beginning. It was no longer government putting initiatives at farmers to incentivize farmers to plant. And this was no longer scientists in the lab coming up with solutions and then going to the farmers. We formalized the National Ginger Working Group that has stakeholders from right across the sector at different entities. So you're looking at the universities, you're looking at the multinational corporations, you're looking at the scientists, you're looking at the farmers. So information was being shared in real time. The problem was being analyzed in real time and therefore that led to several successes. A part of the collaboration looked at applying nuclear technologies. Um, the IAEA came in and through that, we had several capacity building programs, um, technical cooperation programs, which really focused a lot on finding material or developing material to, through the mutagenesis program that would be more tolerant or resistant to the disease. To date, we have over 120 mutants that are showing either tolerance or resistance to the disease. So what came out of it? Essentially, what we did were, was to create centers of excellence through um, infrastructure development and capacity building. So we established specialization in different entities um, where work might have already been going on. And out of that, we end up having infrastructure development. We, had, we still have a very active research program going on. I mentioned before the certification and market access program. So we were not just looking at the planting material, we were also looking at the end. We had several um, manuals developed that are easily accessible and made readily available. So we're showing you how to produce and how to get your products into the market. So we now have greater access to better quality planting material, uh, value chain development from both the producers to the processors to the distributors. We now have the re-emergence of the highly sought after um, endemic varieties of ginger, of Jamaican ginger, and overall improvement in the quality of the industry. So can this model be replicated? We believe it can. And we are now doing similar approach to coffee, um, cocoa and other high value ginger materials. So, or crop materials. So with that, thank you. And I invite you to our conference next month in Jamaica, looking at nuclear technologies in all its fullness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Watson. Our next presentation is going to be presented by Mr. Satyendra Gautam, he is head of the Food Technology Division of the Baba Atomic Research Center in India. His presentation is about scientific cooperation opportunities for food security. Thank you. And very good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm going to talk on scientific cooperation opportunities for food security. Using radiation technology and mutation breeding technique, we have developed in India 62 varieties in 12 different crops, 28 in wild seed crops, 24 in pulse crops, 
tannin cereal, millet and fiber crops. All these mutant varieties has been made available to farmers for cultivation. And what advantage these varieties? They are like earliness, high yield, disease resistance, resistance to abiotic and biotic stress, uh, enhanced nutritional value and so on. Coming to the post-harvest management of the food, uh, food, the radiation processing plants at Vasi was established by Department of Atomic Energy Government of India in 2000 for the high dose application. And subsequently in 2002, Krishak facility at Lasalgaon Nasik, Maharashtra was established for low dose applications. This has resulted in, uh, you can say, setting of 28 food radiation facility in the country as on today. Now, to take the program further, government of India has announced in this financial budget setting of 50 more multi-product food irrigation facility where government is going to give financial support to the industry. Besides this, we have also developed newer uh, food irrigation facilities. One example is low temperature cobalt 60 based marine irradiator <laughs> that was established at Vasi Virit. This is primarily for meat and fish product because they are high in fat and they require to be re radiation process at low temperature. Besides, we have also developed ILINAC facility at Arad Cat in Daur. Now to take the program ahead for the food security, we have done certain large scale commercial trials and deployment of the technology. This is one example of large scale irradiation of onion at Krishak Lasalgaon for reducing severe post-harvest losses. And by this, we can achieve shelf life of onion up to 7.5 months in controlled storage condition. And subsequently, we have done trial with the different government departments like Department of Consumer Affairs, NCCF, and so on to take the program ahead. We have established integrated specialized cold storage facility at Kursak Lasalgaon for onion preservation. We have also done this large scale irradiation of potato for extended and chemical free preservation. No CIPC issue with the potato. And that's why potato has to be preserved in the chemical free manner. Irrated potatoes were found to retain the quality attributes without any sprouting up to eight months under cold storage. Whereas non irritated controls sprouts within 100 days. We are also processed mango fruit radiation for overcoming quarantine barrier of trade. Indian mangoes have been exported to USA since 2007, Australia since 2017, and recently also to Malaysia and South Africa. To further strengthen the program, we have successfully done sea route shipment to the USA of the radiation processed mango in 2022. Now, we have also like paste disinfestation in cereals and pulses is one of the major issues of which radiation technology has excellent potential to take care of that. And you can see the samples here. Even after one year of storage, the quality is pretty good for the radiation process sample. And this is a very effective alternative to the gaseous fumigation that has adverse effect on health and environment. To take the program ahead, we have designed a CGM-137 based prototype grain at BRC. And subsequently, we have, have designed a concept for the high throughput facility, which we are going to commission in very soon. Radiation processing, besides ensuring security, it also assures safety. And one example is the sprout here, you can see. Here you can do the safety assurance as well as the reduction in anti-nutritional factor, that is the value addition in the case of sprouts. And these sprouts have self life of around 12 to 15 days, where the control expires within five days. Semi-dried shrimp can also be very well preserved by radiation processing up to six months. Spices is one of the community here, radiation processing has excellent potential. You can see a spices is stored for more than one year without any infestation. This is one of the commodities that is consumed almost all, whole part of the world. This is the puffed bread. And quite often get contaminated with the fungal contaminants and so on. And as per the data, 22% of losses happened in this particular commodity. 
We have found that after radiation processing, you can keep the, the samples, bread samples up to 10 to 12 days in very good condition, even at room temperature stored. And then you can see the nutritional parameters which we have analyzed for control and stored as well as irrated product, all were almost not changed at all. So this, this one commodity which can be taken at the bigger, very larger scale for the deployment of the radiation technology. So to conclude, I want to tell here that food radiation or radiation processing of food or use of nuclear science and technology, it has application both in the enhanced productivity as I shown in the case of many varieties developed. And also it has excellent potential to control the post-harvest losses. Because once if you don't control post-harvest losses, you have significant loss to the many indirect losses, like losses to the water, losses to the electricity, land uses and so on. So if you are preserving all those things, that is going to add a lot to the food security. And as the green revolution has taken place, in the case of enhancement in the productivity, second green revolution is required for controlling the post-harvest losses, which can help a lot in ensuring uh, food security worldwide. So with this, I uh, want to thank the organizer for giving us the opportunity to share the work what we have done. And in this area of the peaceful application of nuclear energy, we are, uh, there, there is always possibility of collaboration between the different parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Galton. Our next presentation is by Mr. Brian Wade. He is Head of Science and Solutions at Anglo American, and his uh, presentation is about the adoption of economics as metrics of success. Good morning. Thank you to the esteemed panel and to the esteemed audience. I think the unique perspective that I could pr provide today is, is based on personal experience, and there's probably three elements to this experience. So first of all, I am a business person, so working 25 years within the industry, within the private part of private-public partnerships. I am a scientist with a PhD in crop science, understanding plant physiology. But maybe most important today, I am a farmer. I come from a farm in the middle of the United States, a family farm. And while that doesn't represent all farmers of the world, it does provide a perspective on how our partnerships at a international or at a technical or at a level like this that we see on a very uh, deep technical insight can be brought over to the farm level. And so I'd like to start by concluding what should be the outcome, what should be the driver for partnerships. And I think if we put the farmer first, then we can we can meet this measure of success in partnerships. Namely, the economic security of farmers is essential for our combined food security. And if we put that at the beginning of our thought process, then we can build these metrics into partnerships and ensure that we deliver to the farmers. Their uptake or their rate of adoption of new innovations is essential to measure success, and their economic well-being does this improve their livelihood is an essential measure of success. How would we start to think about driving impact? I'll use a very simple equation, but it's also a bit difficult. It's difficult to distill all our work down into the simple equations. From the conclusions of all of our detailed work, if we can clarify that to the farmer in 25 words, if we can demonstrate that their investment of time and resources will start to pay back within two years, and that their return on their investment of time and money for every, let's say, dollar or euro or shilling that goes into the, the new change, that so they return three, three to one to them, then we can get to the point where we can achieve adoption. Backing out to more of the private, of the private partner, pu private public partnership representing Anglo-American, I think we've seen, and the actually purpose of this particular session today is we've defined the strategies of how we can achieve success. Building partnerships, mobilizing resources, having sustainable impact. Things that Adams for Food is asking for from this particular session. When we bring in private industry, we can see the capabilities align very well with these strategies. A particular project that we're working on in Anglo-American is called the Woodsmith Project. We're developing a new 
mine and a new um, fertilizer that can help improve several aspects of crop production. To deliver this project, we have to work globally with over 2,000 different research part projects. We mobilize $8 billion in capital to build the infrastructure. We invest $20 million in demonstrating the performance of the product. We will achieve at uh, full capacity 13 million tons of production per year, and that will last for at least 40 years. So that's a lot of resources being mobilized. This product is already in a pilot stage, and we have some indications of how this could enable some of the future uh, requirements and future criteria that we seek in transforming agricultural production. It is the first new mineral in about 75 years, which is almost a testament to how, how much innovation is needed, how much we need this kind of innovation. It does benefit across multiple aspects of the crop production system, the full continuum of, of soil, crop, and environment. But it is a natural product. It's not processed. It has a high grade already, so you do not generate a lot of carbon emissions or waste or consume a lot of water. It maintains an organic certification, even though it is a very large-scale project. And it goes back to not only the product itself, but how do, we, how do we access a product like this? How do we manufacture it? From what you see on the right is actually the future projection of what this site looks like. And if we look behind the skin or kind of approach this from another, another angle, you can see how this is being developed and engineered to match with the natural landscape, to respect the landscape of that area. So what you're looking at is projected to be, as engineered to be, the largest single site of crop nutrient uh, production in the world. But it looks like a farm. And it's the thought and careful planning that go into this kind of work that enables us to achieve that. The scale is not enough. There is some unique characteristics about these new minerals. And we think that with the work of IAEA and FAO, we can reveal some of these new characteristics of a mineral like polyhalite. We know that we're trying to achieve nutrient use efficiency. We know some of our problem children are nitrogen and phosphorus, but our jobs as parents is not to ignore the problem children, but make them perform a little bit better, make them, make them behave a little bit better. We think we can achieve that with minerals like polyhalite, but we need the tools, the insight, the skills of IAEA and the member states to help us understand the full value of the product. We seek to achieve water use efficiency. And again, we're getting back to the skill set of IAEA and helping us to understand how we can improve water use efficiency. And even find new mechanisms. As we develop new minerals, new mineral resources for agriculture, they behave differently. And we can utilize that different behavior to achieve positive outcomes. Saline soils is the biggest problem that we have in, in, crop, in crop production in terms of scale, in terms of number of hectares that are affected. Almost a billion hectares are affected. Weather soils that have been farmed for a long period of time. All of these can be improved with the use of calcium. And polyhalite is rich in calcium, but there's a large background signal of calcium. There's a large, large geological record. What's interesting about polyhalite, it has a very, very close relative to calcium, essentially a twin. And we can utilize that twin, strontinum, to track the effectiveness of calcium. But we need the help of IAEA <clears throat> to understand how to do that. Calcium also preventing the, the post-harvest losses. Not only the technical detail, we need to bring this back to the farm through a coordinated research project, and I would like to Thank quickly uh, Mr. Zaman, the head of the, the crop and soil management and also um, the uh, crop nutrition section along with the, Director General, the Deputy Director General Mokhtar who is helping us form this partnership. I think when we look at the scale of impact we could have, we can see that bringing forward new minerals is already a multi-billion dollar opportunity but that feeds into a larger initiative of improving overall crop nutrition. And that gets into hundreds of billions of dollars, of single billions for uh, something like a new mineral like polyhalite, hundreds of billions for the overall crop nutrition industry, which are all feeding into primary production, the agricultural production, which
which gets into the trillions of dollars. So the scope of our impact is really limited only by our imagination and the resources that we can mobilize. This is not without its risks. We take a big risk running this project. We are accountable to our shareholders. And to enable some of these future enabling minerals to come to the, to the marketplace to be used on farms, there are some things that we would like to see uh, mitigated or some risks and challenges that we need to work on to ensure that we can bring forward new innovations and not be stuck into 75 years of the same materials. So getting back to the actual title of the presentation, ensuring that we have the metrics in place on farm to measure economic benefits to farmers, to measure impact or rate of, rate of adoption of these new minerals, to ensure that they can see the benefit and they're coming back and they're using more. That's a, a key measure of success. But there's a mutual benefit to all parties involved. It's not just us doing one thing and others doing another thing, it's how do we both give and take in this, in this partnership. To move regulations forward, because they're often based on historical context and what's always been there in the past will be good enough in the future. We need to see regulations evolve so they can allow new products to come to the marketplace. And things like this forum where we're having an active exchange of knowledge. And I would invite everyone to either approach us, meaning my partner, Catherine Bartlett, in the audience, myself, and start a dialogue to see how we can work together. So with that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wade. And our final presentation this morning is going to be by Mr. Joel Avernon. He is Vice President of Picaro. And his presentation is about public-private partnership to support smart climate agriculture, improving resource utilization with laser spectroscopy. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time today. Uh, thank you for the invite to speak. Um, my name is Joel Evernon. I am the VP of uh, the Environmental Division at Picaro. Um, what I always like to tell people is you can't fix a problem if you can't measure it. And that is what we do at Picaro. We are able to measure um, uh, gases in many different forms. Uh, we have been uh, doing this for over 20 years. Uh, we regularly partner with universities, uh, governments and uh, other nonprofits. Uh, we are headquartered in California in Santa Clara. Uh, we have an office here in uh, um, Eindhoven, Netherlands, another office in Beijing. Um, about 300 employees and uh, thousands of instruments deployed worldwide. Uh, as you can see, our instruments go all over the place, mountains. Uh, we have one mountain on the back of a mule that people are doing measurements with. Uh, the key is we're able to take lab quality measurements and deploy them out into the field. And what I want to talk about is how that partnership can help um, and using the things that we've learned um, from nuclear science, specifically around uh, non-radioactive stable isotopes to improve uh, agricultural outcomes. Uh, first of all, um, as uh, alluded to um, Anglo-American, there's a, a big concern in terms of saline soils to monitor the flow of water through an ecosystem. Uh, stable isotopes are the way that we are able to do that to determine you put water on plants, is that water wasted, is it used effectively? Um, traditional isotope research is going to require large expensive instruments. Up there in the upper left you can see a traditional isotope ratio mass spectrometer. Uh, these are expensive, they require a lot of training. Uh, and uh, they use a lot of consumables that might be available at, in, in wealthier countries, but might not be available where they're, they need to be deployed. Um, science and agriculture is very local, so research done in one part of the world won't apply. It has to be done where the agriculture is, is happening. Uh, Picaro partners with the IAEA to supply laser spectrometers to measure water isotopes. There's an example in the upper right you can see uh, how much smaller the instrument is and how much easier to deploy it is um, to increase access for member states to technology that was previously not available in those areas. A um, couple of other examples, these are actually recent installs, uh, one at the Caribbean Institute for Metrology and Hydrology, another one in Trinidad and Tobago. And, and really what this enables is that uh, in these local areas there are environmental challenges that might be different from place to place. 
Uh, these water systems uh, are very much standardized and configured for the applications that they're needed in. Um, you know, when, you, uh, when Picaro as a private company is typically contacted by a university saying, we need to measure water isotopes, we have our traditional sales approach, and okay, we'll configure this, we'll set this up. Through our partnership with the IAEA, we have standardized this from how it's configured, what it comes with, the pricing, everything is put together. It makes deployment a lot easier for Picaro, a lot easier for IAEA. It really increases access to technology and to most critically measurements in areas that those measurements were not able to be made. As I said, if you can't measure a problem, you're not able to fix a problem. In addition to water isotopes, there's other critical measurements, especially as you look at um, uh, measuring uh, the uh, uh, soil respiration, uh, looking at the greenhouse gas impact of uh, agriculture. If you're looking at um, uh, you're trying to look at nitrification, how nitrogen gets uptake through a system, uh, or if you're trying to measure uh, soil metabolism, we look at other non-radioactive but stable isotopes, looking at carbon, looking at nitrogen. So when I spoke about the water isotopes, I was referring to a product that Picaro has made for years that through our partnership with IAEA, we've been able to deploy uh, to more of the world than um, might have had access to the technology before. Looking at carbon and nitrogen, we've taken that a bit of a step further. Um, when you look at traditional measurements, oftentimes, cust uh, oftentimes um, um, researchers will use uh, automated chambers and equipment out in the field. They'll apply fertilizer to a field and make their measurements. You can see an example in the upper right and lower right, and you're talking about quarter million dollars of equipment that is sitting out in an open field making measurements. That's not going to be a possibility in a lot of areas, but that's how a lot of times the science and the equipment was developed. Working with IAEA, we've seen that a lot of, of farmers are going to be using um, Static sampling techniques. There's an example in the upper right where somebody is taking a, a sample and they want to bring it back to a lab as opposed to making the measurements out in the field. Um, by, by seeing the needs of other customers that we aren't traditionally working with, other researchers, uh, we developed a product specifically for this uh, requirement, a, a gas auto sampler. So instead of bringing the equipment out to the field and making the measurements, um, the equipment is actually, the samples themselves can be brought back to a secure lab where the measurements are made. Um, what that does is increases access, increases uh, the ability to make measurements. Uh, and then the other piece that we do is we not only provide uh, training and support, these uh, researchers get access to a worldwide network of other scientists who are using the same equipment to make the same measurements. And we work to incorporate as much of our knowledge and our expertise into our software so that um, even if you're not an expert in using this equipment, you haven't had all of this training, you have the same access to these measurements learned from, the, um, uh, from nuclear science um, that you know, uh, other well-funded um, agencies and researchers uh, might have as well. Um, so um, through that, as I said, Good measurement, um, you know, if you can't measure a problem, you're not gonna be able to fix the problem by deploying good measurement instruments and not only deploying what we have, but developing instruments specifically for this market. Uh, we're able to help improve outcomes, um, making sure that the um, uh, applications of new farming techniques uh, really are going to improve uh, uh, yield and outcomes uh, for the farmers. So thank you very much. Appreciate your attention today. Thank you, Mr. Evrunen. And now we're going to open uh, to you all for questions for our panelists. Now that you've heard from all of them, you've seen their presentations. I'm just looking around in the room. To please uh, show by raising your hand if you have any questions. I'll also be taking questions from our virtual participants. So I see one hand at the back. I see another next to you. I would like to collect a few at a time. OK, let's start with those two. Uh, the lady first and then the gentleman. And perhaps please direct it to um, a single panelist, your question, ideally. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Ingrid Kirsten from the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. Um, I, it's a fantastic panel, and to all of you, thank you so much. It's been uh, really uh, educational and inspiring. 
My question is to the first two panelists, I think from FAO and UNIDO, um, the importance of bringing uh, funding into um, agriculture, food security, um, in a way that really uh, makes an impact and is sustainable is so important. But um, one of the a question I want to ask you, it is my understanding that the, the a big challenge for the IAA and for us in the nuclear community is um, to what extent uh, the uh, official development assistance funds and the philanthropic contributions to agriculture um, include uh, nuclear technology. Um, I'm doing a lot of work on um, how do we expand access to peaceful uses, uh, non-power and power applications in developing countries. One of the key issues there is to bring um, new partnerships to the table and, and very inspiring to hear about the private sector and, and development and the bank's support. But when it comes to ODA funders um, and to the philanthropies, uh, from what I've heard in my experience is that this is a huge challenge uh, because uh, nuclear technology is not seen as something that they want to engage with um, and is still not seen as a tool in the toolbox uh, of um, uh, support for, for agriculture um, and food security. So if you could just speak to that, it would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Sir. Thank you. My name is Hussein Omar uh, from Tanzania, Deputy Mom and Secretary of the Ministry of Agriculture. I have a question to the uh, uh, sixth uh, presenter from India, at uh, the expense from India. So my question is, uh, I would just love to know, what are the capacity of those irradiation facilities, uh, the range of the capacity and the cost, uh, if uh, some country would, uh, would, love to, would love to uh, implement or, or adopt such facilities? How much does it cost? But the second uh, is on, uh, after application of these sort of technologies, uh, what is the rate uh, of reduction in terms of post-harvest losses, if we can share? And the third one is what the uptake uh, uh, of the communities uh, uh, with these technologies. Uh, is it uh, 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 very adaptive or still community, they have some maybe negative perceptions when it comes to radiation? Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll start with you, Dr. Akintasi. It's on. It's on. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that uh, question. Um, I think uh, I cannot agree more with you uh, that um, there is a challenge in uh, mobilizing resources from uh, philanthropic uh, um, entities. Um, in general, uh, mobilizing resources from non-state actors um, can be quite difficult because, especially for, the, for UN, um, the requirements uh, the, the, uh, in terms of due diligence is a bit rigorous. Uh, in many cases, some will not be qualified even if they have the resources to offer. So that's a, an, an important uh, problem there. But uh, it is on case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Um, what is not one size fits all. I think uh, for the specific uh, question on, on, on the area of nuclear, um, nuclear uh, energy, I think, or technologies, I think it is the problem of um, what I mentioned earlier, the development versus um, humanitarian issues. Um, there are some areas that are more attractive because they receive good headlines and, and some are very easy to fund than the others, but when it comes to more long-term, more research for development issues, uh, it can be difficult for uh, not only philanthropic, even uh, private sectors uh, to fund. Um, thank you. Mr. Berger, would you like to add to that as well? Yeah. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Ingrid, for, for these questions. And uh, from my side, um, uh, of course, um, you know, I worked for more than 30 years in uh, German government in different functions, and now since two years here with UNIDO. Um, and as my colleague mentions, sometimes uh, in the past, I saw, especially in Germany, there is, uh, let me say, a little bit of distance uh, from, uh, let me say, the 
the um, stakeholders in the developing cooperation to work th to, together with the private sector, with companies. Uh, uh, my colleague mentions the questions of due diligence, um, but, but in UNIDO I see there's a little bit another approach. We are very open, we have a lot of, lot of uh, cooperation with, uh, with uh, uh, the private sector, also with foundations like Illy Foundation, Lavazza Foundation, um, uh, and of course there are interests from, from their sides, and I think this interest are fully okay, uh, because uh, uh, Ili and Lavazza, they need coffee. They need coffee production and they see and they feel that coffee production through climate issues but also through the way of how, how the production um, uh, is organized, uh, living wages and so on, uh, put conditions on the crowd, uh, they see they have to invest mm -hmm. uh, in this uh, value chains. And, and here we see a lot of um, added value in our, our cooperation. And other way, uh, we are working, of course, also together with, with um, foundations like uh, Neumann Foundation in the same uh, sector, but also with Fair Trade International. We have a new partnership uh, um, in, the, uh, in the cocoa production. And when it comes to your question, uh, importance of funding in, in, in sustainable, um, agriculture, yes, of course, uh, 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 there's a lot of uh, things to do. We as UNIDO, we try to, to, to work also to support our partner countries in more or less reaching uh, the new rules from the EU European legislation, deforestation um, um, uh, legislation. You know, there's a lot of problem for smallholder farmers and there's a lot of things to do. Uh, regarding the uh, question of nuclear technology, I'm also, sorry, not the right person. That is uh, something perhaps we have to discuss with my friend Najat Mokda in, in future, what we can do more together uh, if it comes to this special kind of technology. Thank you. Mr. Galton? Hello. It's on. It's on. Hello. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I collect uh, your question in three stages. First, you are asking about the capacity of the facility. Second, you are asking about the processing cost mm -hmm. or capex probably. And second, thi a third question was the whatever the consumer you can say response to the produce. Is it correct? Yeah. So coming to the capacity of the facility, as you told, we have currently 28 food ration facility operational in the country. Most of these facilities are high through facility, having source system to 1,000 KCA. As far as the throughput of the produce is concerned, depend on the commodity. Like suppose you take the example of onion or potato, for which that comes 10, 10 tons per hour or so. If you go the uh, like high dose required capacity as spices or so, that volume comes around 3 tons per hour or so. So uh, the, most of the facilities are high throughput facility. Now coming to the pro costing of that, you are the capex. Capex again depend country to country and there uh, you can say uh, a lot of factors are there, like literally required civil structure, mechanization and so on. In India, it comes close to around uh, 18 to 20 crores of Indian rupees uh, per facility. And as far as the processing cost is concerned, again, it will be the commodity specific. Like for onion, suppose, it comes very minuscule. Like, and in general, I can make a statement, processing cost is much, much lesser, less than 5% of the, your, the produce cost or so on. So, but it does a lot of value addition. Third part of your question was the acceptance for the consumers. Uh, I think, uh, honestly, I think many times we uh, think for the consumers, but ability of the product is first important criteria to judge the consumer response. So, as whatever the produce we have, 28 facilities are too less or too minuscule for even catering our own domestic need. And most of these facilities are involved in the export of the produce and so on. But as we have seen in the sun, large scale trial of potato and onion, we didn't find com consumer resistance as far as the acceptance is concerned. They like, only thing you have to make them aware, you tell them what it is, and once the consumer are well aware, then acceptance does not uh, become the issue. And one example I will tell you. Last 17 years, India is exporting mango to USA from 2007. We now have started to three more countries, I have shown my presentation. But I, we, we didn't find any sort of, uh, you can say consumer, you can say um, uh, negative response from any part of the world. So if we develop the capacity and try to address, make them aware, then, and, and finally you have to take 
the finally we have to pro, uh, preserve the produce how to as I told you the second part, uh, part of the green revolution management to the post harvest uh, produce what he will do? What are the options? You are going for the chemical fumigants that leave the residue in the commodity. So make this type of awareness to the consumer. No? Consumers will be happily going to accept this technology. This my, we believe in this company. I think I have answered your all three questions. Is something remaining? Can you let me? There Thank might you. be one about the the rate of the reduction of post harvest yeah, losses. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I will I will again the commodity aspect. In the case of onion, mm -hmm. I will tell you losses are basically negligible. Many times you have to integrate radiation technology with the complementary technology. Like for onions. We have radiation technology with the coal storage. Then losses are even less than 5 percent and that loss is also just a bet loss. No other losses are there. Same thing is the potato also. A spices, other things, almost lo losses I can tell less than 5 percent. Negligible. Literally it is negligible. Thank you. Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? I see one hand on that. Okay. Let's take that one for now. I have a, a fairly quick question for, uh, I guess, for Brian, and uh, so I want each for Brian and for Joe. For Brian, the, the part of here, right, I guess it's a very new product. I'm wondering if you can use a minute or two to provide a fairly quick summary as to um, the findings to date and uh, the way forward, like, you know, what's next uh, for Joe. Can you possibly uh, tell us a bit about these different isotope uh, measurements are the um, can be done in one instrument or has it been have to be done in multiple instruments and I guess I have seen some of the uh, field based instruments uh, some of them seems to be quite bulky uh, are there any efforts to try to uh, reduce the size of those field instruments thank you dr. Wade will stop with you so just a quick overview Polyhalide is the mineral, and that mineral contains four essential nutrients for crop production, specifically potassium, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. Those are hard to find in other resources, so it is a large um, opportunity to bring forward these, uh, these nutrients that are often associated with quality as much as they are with, with quantity of production. Um, what also makes this unique is that it's, it's such a high grade or such a high purity of mineral. That means the, the content of nutrients is so high, but it doesn't require any processing or any separation of things you don't want. So you end up with four key macronutrients for crop production produced in a very friendly way and in a form that farmers can utilize quite easily. So they, they like to have certain formulations because their machines are set up to apply it that way. Uh, the blending of other nutrients is, is facilitated by this form. But in that sense, we think there's a real opportunity, and that's the objective of the Woodsmith Project, is to scale up the availability of this unique resource that's at the moment only found in the UK. This mineral deposit is only in the UK. Um, the challenge then is to bring forward something new to a marketplace that is traditionally dominated by uh, very commoditized, multi-decade-old products that the that the market and the farmers have become very used to. So, trying to bring across the education and hopefully our partnerships with IAEA and FAO can help explain how this works and demonstrate some of the advantages, and ultimately to generate the the rate of adoption and economic value for the farmer. Uh, thank you. Regarding your uh, question on instruments, uh, typically uh, there are different instruments for different tasks. One of the ways we've been able to accomplish moving this from a high-end lab research grade instrument to something you can is more or less able to be deployed worldwide has been using off-the-shelf lasers from the telecom industry, right? So a completely unrelated industry helping science and helping our research. Um, typically that will make different instruments for the different types of measurements that you're doing, whether it's uh, water isotopes, carbon isotopes, or nitrogen isotopes. Uh, regarding making them smaller, able to go out to the field, um, you know, s sometimes I say they are luggable because you can put them on a cart and pull them out, um, but they are not handheld or portable. Uh, typically what we have seen is uh, either instruments are put onto a cart and brought to the field, uh, or in the case of, um, as I mentioned before, this gas auto sampler, uh, people will take samples from the field and bring them back to their lab and then analyze them back there. 
Um, and oftentimes when they do go to the field, there's power requirements, chamber requirements, and other things. So we are looking at making things more portable, um, but today it's, it, that's, kinda, that's kind of where it is for portability. Thank you. We have about two minutes left, so if there is a burning question, I can take that one. If not, we'll close our session, and I just want to give, perhaps invite us all to applaud our speakers this morning for the wonderful presentations. Thank you very much uh, to you, Dr. Akin Fessi, to Mr. Berger, to Dr. Sali, to Ms. Samut, uh, to Dr. Watson, uh, Mr. Galtim, Dr. Wade, and of course to you as well, Mr. Brunin. Much appreciated.